Okay, so uh, thank you everybody for, for showing up. Uh, this talk will be about RAG. So is really RAG all you need? So we're going to have a look at the limits of retrieval augmented generation, uh, what it is, what is it used for, what is it very good at, and also like what is it not very good at, like where it fails, uh, what can go wrong with it, and how kind of to mitigate a little bit the problems that you might have with your RAG system. So let's get started. First of all, a quick outline. Again, first of all, we're going to see what RAG is, like what does RAG stands for, how does it work more or less. We're going to see the failure mode of these sort of systems. So really, in which, in which cases it fails, why and what you can do about it. We're going to see the evaluation strategies that you can like, put in place in order to uh, understand if your system is failing this way. And then at the end, we're going to have a little bit of an overview of like what you can do on top of it. So RAG itself, we're gonna see it's pretty simple in like in this most basic form. So we're gonna see how can you improve on it, what can you do to go further than like basic RAG. Okay, so first of all, what is it? The definition of RAG is like retrieval augmented generation. So RAG is a technique to augment the LLM's knowledge beyond its training data by retrieving contextual information before generating an answer. So these like, uh, three steps, or better two steps you're going to see, are really the core of the whole technique. And you're going to see that's much easier than like, a lot of other explanations make it seem like. Uh, first of all, RAG is a, really a technique that is very suitable for question answering. So LLMs can do many things, can do summarization, can do translation, but RAG is a technique that's focusing on like, answering questions that users might have. So sort of like, uh, you know, search systems or like really document search, something like this. Already question answering, RAG is really good at these sort of tasks. So, first of all, when users have questions, uh, in a RAG system, first of all, this question goes to a component that is called a retriever, which is the first step we've seen also in the acronym like RAG. There is first a retrieval step. What this retriever is, it's basically any sort of software system that can do search. So, for example, a lot of people think immediately, because you're talking about LLMs and stuff like this, that a retriever must be a vector database, like we 8 or Chroma or like something like that. But in practice, any system that, given a question or a keyword even, can return you some like related documents, related context, is, uh, can be used as a retriever here. So for example, Google, like any search API that you might have, Elasticsearch, or even like something much more like corner case, imagine like searching through Discord messages or like GitHub search, whatever you might, you might want to use to search for like snippets of text into any sort of corpus you might have can work as a retriever. Uh, after you have done this step, so from your question, you retrieved uh, somehow in some way some sort of context that you might want to use to answer the question, then the next step is to building a prompt for the LLM. Uh, because before generating, you have to take the information you retrieved at this stage and basically put it together with the question in a way that the LLM can understand. RAG prompts are normally very easy. In their ma most basic form, they really read like this. For example, read the text below and answer the question. This is already a valid RAG prompt, and as soon as you attach like, the context you retrieved before and the question the user has given, this is ready to go to the LLM next. After you have this prompt, again, you send it to the generator, which nowadays really mostly uh, represents an LLM because that's the system that can more, most reliably generate text from a prompt like this. And uh, this prompt given to an LLM will normally result in an answer that can be given back to the user. Uh, yeah, so RAG systems in their very core, in their very basic, basic essence, are something like this that works in three steps, retrieving, building a prompt, and then generating an answer from this prompt. Uh, why using RAG? So when would you want to do this? Uh, first of all, one of the main benefits that are most, mostly advertised is that RAG reduces hallucination. That's actually true because the LLM, when it's given a RAG prompt, it doesn't have to like, know the answer to your question. It can just read the context that is in the prompt and just basically rephrase it, which is a lot easier for the LLM to do, because LLMs are much better at just manipulating text than also like storing information. They're very good at that too, 
but really like reading text and understanding it and rewriting it, it's a lot easier task for them. Also, it can be handled by, for example, simpler and smaller LLMs. Uh, however, it is to be kept in mind that uh, it does not remove, remove hallucinations completely. We're gonna see about this because a lot of people seem to imagine that RAG is like a silver bullet. You implement RAG, you have no hallucinations whatsoever. This is not true. RAG reduces hallucination, but it doesn't remove them. So you always have to pay attention to that. Uh, RAG is also great to let an LLM access fresh data. So for example, if you want to use LLMs to like discuss about the news, you cannot really do it with a model that doesn't have really a RAG implemented on top of it. Because LLMs are trained on data that is necessarily always older than the point when you ask the question. Training an LLM is a very long process, and you have also to collect the data beforehand. So with all the time that passes, by the time you collect the data, you use it to train the LLM, and then you ask the question, by then, any, even the most recent data you added, it will be old. So the only real way to make RAG able to reason on like the news, for example, or like very fluctuating information, like, I don't know, the weather forecast, the stock market, whatever, you need to give them access to recent data. And this is something that RAG really shines at because it can retrieve data at the time when the question is asked and give this sort of data to the LLM for, uh, for it to be able to like reason properly. And uh, last but not least, uh, RAG can be seen as a way to increase the transparency of how like LLM respond to the users. Because uh, when, for example, also when the LLM responds in a specific way, that maybe it's not the way you expected, it's, easy, it's easier to go see why the LLM replied in that specific way by checking what the prompt contained. If the prompt contained a source that indeed like seems to, let's say, contradict the way you were expecting the reply to be, then you know that it was the retriever that found something that made the LLM reply this way. Of course, again, this is subject to mistakes, but uh, it normally helps a lot understanding what's going on in the LLM and why it replied that way. So let's have an example of two systems, one that doesn't use RAG and one that uses RAG, to see really what the difference can be in practice. Uh, for a system that doesn't have RAG implemented, uh, I have an example from ChatGPT, like the really basic version, the 3.5 that has no RAG implemented. While for a RAG system, I could have used like a later GPT, but uh, just for a change, I decided to use perplexity in here to see a system that really implements RAG uh, can do. So if I ask ChatGPT 3.5, where does EuroPython 2024 takes place? ChatGPT is very confident. That tells me that it takes place in Dublin. Because back then, when it, was, when it was trained, EuroPython has been in Dublin. The most recent one has been there. So it's like, yeah, of course it's been there again. Like, that's, that's the best of my knowledge. Interestingly, uh, uh, ChatGPT doesn't even realize that it's inferring something wrong. It just assumes very confidently that this is the answer, because it, this is all that it can take from its internal knowledge. That's really the best it can do. Instead, if I uh, ask perplexity, where does EuroPython 2024 takes place? Uh, first of all, the answer is correct. EuroPython takes place in Prague. So uh, perplexity at least gives me a proper answer. Not only, but it also tells me where it found this information. So you can see on the top there is like a sources list where you can see the EuroPython website and you know that most likely this is correct because this is the official EuroPython website. So RAG really reduces hallucination it increases the transparency, and also like, makes the LLM able to access fresh data. So you can see in here really clearly that these three things all take place. Again, probably some of you knows that like, uh, perplexity AI is also like, not infallible by any means, but at least for these like, simple tasks, the improvement is really like, strong. Uh, okay, so now that we talk about what RAG is good at doing, let's see what, is, like, the, what, what are the ways in which it can fail. Uh, first of all, like we've seen, the RAG has two critical steps. So first of all, there is retrieval, and then there is generation. So each of these can fail in different ways. A retrieval failure looks like uh, an issue when a retriever component, the retriever component, whatever it is, fails to find the relevant context that you needed to answer the question. So the retriever returns some data that doesn't really help answering the question, so the LLM really doesn't know what to do with it and mostly, most likely returns like a weird answer. Uh, instead, a generation failure is when even when the retriever found the correct context, so all the data is in the prompt, 
uh, then this prompt is given to the LLM, and the LLM still replies something that is like just not related to the question, or even like an hallucination. So there are these two different, uh, different types of failures, and this, this have to be evaluated like separately. This is an example of a successful query that you can do with, uh, with RAG. So for example, let's ask a question that normally ChatGPT doesn't know out of the box. For example, what was the official language of the Republic of Rose Island? Also, like, I suppose most of you don't even know what, what this answer to this question would be, so you cannot just double check for yourself. Uh, in the case of a successful uh, run, the retriever would find you some snippets from wherever it's looking, for example, the internet. Uh, you can see in the snippets, it's very clear like what the language is. So the first one, all of them really clarify that the official language was Esperanto. And then the LLM reads this context and say, okay, the, the, the official language was Esperanto. So this is how you expect the system really to work in practice. A retrieval failure looks like this. Given the same question, the retriever find some information about the topic, so it's not entirely wrong, but also the information it retrieved doesn't really contain the information you expected it to. So, for example, it tells you where this, this uh, C platform was. It tells you that it was near the coast of Italy. So the LLM already starts thinking, okay, it's there, that might, might help uh, inferring the, the language. And then it can tell you like, yeah, it had the problem with the Italian police. So okay, so it was really close to Italy somehow, it had the like relationship with it, and it says nothing else. So the LLM really takes a best guess here, reads the context, and it's like, most likely the official language must have been Italian, which we know is not true now. So this is clearly a retrieval failure, the LLM is doing its best, but the retriever just literally confuses the LLM to provide a wrong answer. Why retrieval fails? So there are several reasons, because also there are several ways to do retrieval in the first place. Uh, but one of the most common is that sometimes the relevant data just does not exist in the database. If you, for example, were looking in a very restricted uh, set of web pages, or actually Wikipedia contains this information, but maybe Wikipedia in other languages doesn't. So if your system was only looking in that sort of corpus, the data must, might just not be there, and then the retrieval will fail because simply the data is just not retrievable because it's not existing. So in that case, you want to just make sure that the data is there, first of all. Uh, in other cases, the retrieval algor algorithm might be just, just too naive. There are a lot of fairly naive retrieval, retrieval algorithms, for example, one based on keyword search. For this sort of, for like RAG application, you have to be a bit careful with them because, for example, they are unable to retrieve context that contains synonyms. So if the user poses a question with a synonym, and then you pass it through, for example, TF-IDF, the ranking will not be as you expect, because a lot of the context that contains the synonym only will not be retrieved. And that also makes like retrieval harder, and therefore like, uh, it's more prone to this sort of failures. Uh, there are more advanced methods, like for example, uh, doing a vector search, but those are based on uh, using embedding models for both the question and the context. And sometimes also the embedding model might be too small or maybe too naive or maybe not suitable for the data. It happens, especially if you have a very like, uh, like niche context, I don't know, medical or legal or like something very complicated and scientific that has many weird uh, like terminology, for example. Embedding models might be just not up to the task. So you might want to choose an embedding model that is suitable for the data you're having in case you're using already vector search and still retrieval is like a weak spot. Uh, on top of that, the data might not be chunked properly because this is something that not everybody knows, but most of the retrieval techniques really are not very good at handling huge chunks of text or very tiny chunks of test, text. So some people think that just having a list of PDFs, maybe huge PDFs, it's enough to, for doing search. But most of the time you want to pre-process your data a very little just to chunk it in manageable pieces that contain just a little bit of information. This way, retrieving like the really the right piece of his information is much easier for most of the retrieval methods out there, and it's also easier for the LLM to parse because the LLM has to read less text. There are less occasions to get confused. So, in general, chunking the data in such a way that it's in like small bytes, it's uh, very helpful for retrievers to, to to handle. And then last but not least, the data in the questions might be in different languages, which like throws off keyword search, and it's sometimes also challenging for vector embeddings, so just 
keep in mind that if you are handling uh, uh, questions and uh, questions and context from different languages, you really want to make sure that you can handle multilingual queries. All right, next, let's see. Oh no, <laughs> I forgot this one. So sometimes there is a, a tricky situation in which the retrieval might be failing, but you don't see a failure at the end of the pipeline because if you're using a very, very smart LLM, like an LLM that has a large knowledge, knowledge, uh, knowledge base, like, I don't know, a GPT or something like that, uh, sometimes the LLM is smart enough that he sees the question, he sees the retrieved context, and he's like, well, no, the context is like, it's bogus. I'm gonna try something else. I'm gonna just invent something that is not in the context. So sometimes the LLM is smart enough to really like understand that there was a failure in between and hide the failure. So if you only have, like check your, uh, your system from question to answer without checking what's happening in the middle, you might be missing a lot of retrieval failures if your LLM is too smart to let you notice that the failure, like the failure was there. So it's a bit tricky also to spot this and uh, it's something to keep in mind for evaluation especially. Uh, yes, so uh, moving on, there also are generation failures. So something that goes a bit like that. Um, we have the same question as before. What is the official language of the Republic of Rose Island? The retrieval is spot on. It gives you all like the snippets that contain this information. But somehow your LLM is such that it sees this context, it sees this question, and it doesn't understand what the question or the context was really about. So it just reads it, but it doesn't understand what it's reading. And then it makes up an answer. These sort of failures are the most puzzling because even if you see the prompt, the LLM is just really not following it. So this might be really confusing and they are also like, to be honest, the most opaque to debug. Uh, why do they happen? Most often, this is because you choose a model that is too small and just cannot follow instructions. Sometimes people go for really, really tiny models that can barely follow instructions at all. So if you have maybe a slightly more complicated prompt or something like that, the LLM just, just cannot follow instructions very well and it's prone to hallucinating somehow. Uh, sometimes, maybe the model is not that small, even though this is rare to happen with lar really large models. Maybe the model is like, okay, it's like maybe 8 billion parameters, something like this. But maybe it's too small to like understand the domain really because your domain is so specialized and it has such a weird terminology that really the model doesn't understand the question and it kind of makes up something generic. For example, if you're asking, I don't know, the side effects of a specific medicine on a specific condition or something like this, the model trained on Wikipedia is not gonna know most of these terms maybe. So sometimes it's just prone to making stuff up because it doesn't understand what it's being asked to do. Uh, another potential issue is that maybe the RAG prompt is not built properly. Some, especially some small models are very sensitive to how the prompt is built. So if you have like tapos, if you have like weird formatting or like special characters, Sometimes the LLM gets confused by those. So you have to check what's in your RAG prompt and maybe like slightly clean, clean your data to avoid this sort of like confusion from, uh, from the LLM. And then last but not least, again, just make sure that the model is multilingual when you do this because sometimes if you ask a question in a language that the LLM doesn't understand, just like a human, it will not be able to answer you. So yeah, these are the most common. And uh, now that we've seen the failures that we might uh, come across, Let's have a look at the evaluation strategies. So let's see uh, in which way we can like evaluate a system like RAG in a way that like makes sense and gives us the most, uh, the most insights. Uh, first of all, there are like two ways to evaluate a RAG system. You can do both, so they are not exclusive, but there are like two main uh, techniques. So one is called isolated evaluation. Uh, in this case, you evaluate the retrieval and the generation separately. So you just take the two components in isolation and you test them like they were, they were working in isolation. Um, this is, is useful to understand really which one is weaker and which one is stronger. Uh, but the other method, like end-to-end -end evaluation, which means like the, to evaluate the, the entire system from the question to the answer as if like uh, the RAG uh, application was a black box, that is also very useful and it can spot issues that you might not be able to spot in uh, isolated evaluation because it can spot integration issues. For example, it can spot issues with the RAG prompt or something that goes on in the way you pass the context to the LLM. So both are useful, they are useful in different ways. Uh, and especially when you're starting, you might want to do a little bit of both and then you can, you can choose which one is most important for the type of application you're making. 
So, uh, for isolated evaluation, uh, let's, let's see how to evaluate like, the retrieval step. This is a very huge topic, to be honest, because there are a lot of retrieval methods, and all of them are very different. Most of them have their own evaluation techniques. So there are, what I can say here is that there are two main categories of like retrieval methods. There are some that are keyword-based and some that are vector-based. So keyword-based algorithms are a bit less powerful because again, they have problem with multilingual uh, corpora and they have problem with synonyms most of the time, but they are much easier to evaluate because you can evaluate them with them using like traditional techniques like measuring recall precision, F1. So those are pretty standard. They are like a much more, um, uh, how can I say, um, well, well explored area. So this is, this is easier to do. There are much more tools available for this sort of evaluation. On the flip side, like the search methods of like vector databases or like embedding similarity, these are a bit newer and uh, evaluating them is much harder because the context and the question might not have nearly anything in common except from the meaning connecting the two. So measuring whether the context you retrieve through vector search is relevant or not and how relevant it is, it's not very easy. So some people does this with other realms. It's expensive, so it really depends on what you're doing and how much of it you're doing. Or they're using metrics like really semantic answer similarity, which we'll see how is it computed in a second. But uh, like the evaluation itself is le a bit less clear, a bit less like, um, how can I say, a bit less meaningful. Because indeed, understanding also how relevant the context is to a question is also a bit subjective. So it's really hard to assess in a really objective way. Uh, for evaluating generation, that is even harder because LLMs are really hard to evaluate. Like the output of an LLM, it's really hard to evaluate. A simple way of doing this is using another LLM to evaluate your main LLM. Especially if you plan to use a RAG with a small model, you can evaluate it by sending like, its answers to a larger model. This is something that a lot of people do because it's very easy, fundamentally, and it provides quite decent results. Uh, also, a benefit of this method is that responses can be evaluated according to different criteria. So you can choose the criteria you want to evaluate it for, for, uh, about. For example, you can check for completeness, conciseness, relevance. Like you have many metrics you can like define and then ask another LLM to evaluate uh, about. Uh, also, the metrics or the criteria you want to evaluate uh, generation about really depends on the application, you, the applications of your RAG application. So for example, if it's like a scientific application, you might want uh, to use fo focus especially on factual accuracy. If it's more like for customer support, conversation quality is also very important because you want to like help people feeling a bit helped. Or for personal assistance, you want to really be a bit more concise. So you can also evaluate criteria that normally would be very hard to like assess uh, just with a, with a numeric metric like F1, for example. Uh, next, about end-to-end -end evaluation, uh, this is honestly the hardest in general because understanding if a question is like if a question and an answer actually match, really depends on the person. Like sometimes, sometimes it's easy to measure. Like if I ask what's the capital of France, okay, the answer has to contain Paris somehow. But if I'm asking something open-ended, it's really hard to assess. So one of the techniques that is taking place in here is measuring semantic similarity which is nothing else than the cosine similarity between the answer and the ground truth you were expecting for that question. So you have a data set already with question and answers you expect, reasonable answers you expect, and then you measure the cosine similarity. This is not foolproof because, again, there might be different ways to answer a question, and cosine similarity might not be perfect in those cases. So you have to take it with a pinch of salt, but right now, this is one of the most popular techniques, so that's, that's a way you can use to, to measure your, uh, your, the, like, the, um, the performance of your RAG pipeline. Uh, some libraries also use this, indeed, this weighted average between uh, the semantic answer similarity and F1 score, because some questions, indeed, need to contain keywords. As I said, like, uh, uh, if you're asking what's the capital of France, you can measure with F1 metrics, like, uh, if Paris is present, and that's like already like a bit better than just semantic similarity alone. 
So you might also make a, weight, make a weighted average here, depending on whether your application is supposed to answer in a specific way. Um, on top of that, to like even add more uh, generated, uh, generated stuff on top of this evaluation pile, uh, sometimes you can use synthetic evaluation data sets to do your evaluation. So you don't even need to build yourself uh, the data set with question and answers to evaluate against. But some libraries like Ragas, for example, uh, make you uh, create the synthetic evaluation data sets for you. So you just generate the data set and then evaluate against it. Again, each of these steps needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. You should check the data that is generated before like trusting the scores. But this is something that can help you also save a lot of time and money depending on like how often you have to do this sort of evaluations. Uh, next. Uh, for the example that I wanted to show you like real quick, uh, I'm using a, this framework called Haystack. So Haystack is a Python open source uh, framework that is, can be used to build like uh, RAG applications. The good part about this one, which like, like other LLM framework, is that uh, you can use it to build your RAG application and evaluate it at the same time. So it's nice that uh, several evaluation libraries are already, already integrated and you can also integrate your own fairly easily. So it's, it's a pretty nice framework. It's much simpler to use them like other popular LLM frameworks out there. It's like really lightweight, it's pretty cool. So if you didn't hear about this, I recommend you to check it out. And uh, in here in the QR code, you can see their tutorial about how to do pipeline, basically RAG pipelines evaluation. So if you're curious about how, like, how they do it, just uh, have a look in there and, and check it out. For the example though, I'm not using any of the frameworks that they integrated natively. I just use another one that uh, is called like uh, continuous evaluation. Now, we're gonna see how to do it in a second. First of all, this is how I build an A-stack pipeline. Now, this might look like a lot of code, but in practice, there are like three steps. First of all, you generate all your components. In this case, you generate a text embedder and a retriever, which work together to embed the question and then retrieve the question from a corpora that you might have put in your document store here. Then you have a prompt builder that does really string interpolation to just build the rag prompt that we've seen before. And then you have a generator in here that indeed is uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo, so pretty easy. This, these are the components of the pipeline. Then you create the pipeline object and then you build the pipeline with this like two sets of calls. First of all, you add the components to the pipeline, and in the moment when you add them, they are not connected to each other. You connect them to each other at the last step with a connect call, where you basically tell the text embedder to send its output to the retriever, the retriever to send its output to the prompt builder, and the prompt builder to send its output to the LLM. So you build pipelines in this way, which is probably a bit verbose, but it's like at least very declarative. You can see uh, what's going on, and it's pretty simple. Actually, Haystack supports very complicated pipelines, so you can make branches, you can make loops, but indeed for RAG you mostly don't need it, so this is a simple RAG pipeline that you can build with it. Uh, from this pipeline, how do you evaluate it? Uh, here is how you evaluate with a library called Continuous Eval. This is built by Rilari AI, and it's again a pipeline that allows you, sorry, uh, a framework that allows you to evaluate pipelines in isolation and end-to-end, -end. so you have several ways to evaluate the pipeline. Uh, you can see in here what's happening. First of all, uh, you decide which are the outputs that you want to measure. So you want to measure, for example, the LLM answer and the retrieved context, because we are gonna do like isolated evaluation. So you basically select the, those. Then you create an evaluate, like a pipeline evaluator object in here, and then you add metrics to it. So for the LLM, for example, you can add several metrics. In this case, there are deterministic, uh, deterministic metrics like uh, something checking for F1, yeah. For example, like uh, uh, if a keyword is present in the specific answer or not. Uh, there are metrics that are LLM based, for example, this faithfulness that makes sure that the question and the answer, like sorry, the answer really is answering the question, so it's not talking about something related or it's not like going on a tangent or something. And then you can have like custom metrics, like conciseness. For example, I decided like it's not in the example, but you can see it in the QR code that the size is defined in the, in the code in there. Uh, for example, conciseness, maybe I'm, I want to build like a, a personal assistant, so I don't want GPT to talk for three hours every time I ask a question. So I make sure that conciseness is also measured. Um, for the retriever, you do basically the same. In this case, uh, for example, we're measuring F1 
one, precision recalling here, which is deterministic. Again, uh, it depends on really what uh, the question you expect are, but there are also several metrics for, um, for retrievers as well. So uh, this is just a part of the example. See the full example here at the, at the link in here. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to make it run, so just uh, have a try and, and check it out. Okay, so this is more or less the evaluation part. Uh, after that, like after your like rug system works and it's like it's evaluated properly, you know the performance it's having, you may want to improve on it. And there are several ways to do this. Actually, there are too many ways to do it. So I kind of selected four that I found the most like used, the most like as the most representative of the field right now. Uh, one of the easy like let's say the lowest hanging uh, opportunities to improve your RAG system is to have multiple retrievers because sometimes uh, your application might need to access data that is in very different formats. For example, you might need to search through uh, PDFs, like long text PDFs, but you might also need to search at the same time through, for example, semi-structured text, or you might need to search maybe even through images. How do you know? Uh, in these cases, it's very hard to find a retriever that always works for all these types of data at the same time. So you might want to have specialized retrievers and make them all run, make them all retrieve some context, what they think that's relevant in their specific data set, and then use a ranker to take these few results and really understand which one is best. Rankers are much more accurate than retrievers normally because they are designed to work with very little data and really be much more accurate. So retrievers are normally focusing on like speed and performance uh, at the expense a little bit on precision. So rankers instead do the opposite. So they expect very little input data, like three times the, the data they are expected to output maybe, and then just uh, shrink it down a little bit to rank it precisely. Uh, so this is like one of, the, one of the most straightforward way to improve your RAG system. Uh, another, Fairly straightforward one, like about uh, self-correcting. So for example, at the end of the pipeline, maybe before sending the answer to the user, you might want to send it first to another LLM and check whether the other LLM as well thinks that the, the answer is correct. So you may want to like, if the answer is not correct, you may want to send it back to the retriever, do maybe another loop. So self-correcting is designed to catch this sort of like hallucinations by just double checking. It's not like foolproof again, but can catch some errors, like you have, you are again reducing a little bit more the probability of hallucinations, so it might be worth it depending on your application. Another one is like agentic systems. So this is just a fancy word for application that needs to handle both RAG and non-RAG queries. So uh, for example, if people is asking at the same time to your application, what's the capital of France and uh, what is 20 plus 30, the first one clearly might need some context, the second one clearly does not. Actually, giving context to the second question might even confuse the LLM and make it produce an answer that is really wrong. So uh, at, the, at the start of these pipelines, you might want to put a classifier. So something, maybe still an LLM or maybe another classifier that you trained, that decides whether this question needs context or not, and just run the retriever if the question needs context. So this is nice, it can improve the scope of the question that your system can handle. Uh, it's actually, as far as I know, quite used, so that's, that's a nice one. And the last one, which is like, I think the most fancy one, the most like complicated, is multi-hope. So in this case, you use chain of thought to make a series of retrieval based on the context. Maybe the question is really complicated, I don't know, something like, uh, uh, when was the sister of the current king of Sweden born? Something like this. When you, you really need to retrieve it in steps. You need to retrieve who's the current king of Sweden, does this person have a sister? And when does this sister was born? So you need to do three retrieval runs. The LLM needs to understand, okay, I have to ask three questions here. It has to send three retrieval queries, and then it has to aggregate all the results together. Uh, Multi-hop is much more complicated, and it's useful like if you have like a really complex question or you need to explore a topic. Uh, but in practice, it's also very expensive, and it can be a bit brittle. So this one needs to be used with care. Uh, okay, last but not least, a word on fine-tuning. So a lot of people seem to believe that uh, fine-tuning is an alternative to RAG, you either do one or the other. In practice, this is really not true. Fine-tuning should, sometimes should be used with RAG, like the two really can only, can only help each other. 
uh, especially fine tuning can be used together with RAG if your domain is really complex, like indeed uh, medical, legal, or like scientific domains, uh, because it can help the LLM understand what the question is about. It can help improve uh, situations in which your LLM has a lot of generation failures because it doesn't understand the question at all. So fine tuning is really good in this situation. A caveat here is that uh, sometimes you need to fine tune both the LLM and your embedding model because in order to do retrieval with an embedding, uh, with an embedding, uh, embedding similarity, for example, also the embedder needs to understand what is the meaning of the questions. So it also needs to, for example, understand what the keywords kind of, what's the meaning of the keywords you're using in order to embed them properly in order to find more relevant results. So this is something that is a bit less little known, but um, there's something that can also improve a lot of situations in which your retriever is underperforming and you kind of find a way to improve it, and improve it in other ways. Uh, last but not least, fine tune can also help to alter a little bit the behavior of your LLM. So if you want to have, for example, a specific voice or you want to improve conciseness or something like this, you can do it with prompt engineering, but uh, it's often not very consistent. So if you want to be really sure that you want to improve your LLM in that direction and you want to do it strongly, fine tuning is normally the best idea. All right, so that's all. Uh, you can see in here, uh, I have also a talk summary on my, on, on my personal blog. So if you, can, uh, if you want to check it out, it's there. That's it, thank you for listening. Right. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for this very interesting talk. Uh, we still have a good five minutes left. So for Q&A, we would ask you to queue up on the two microphones in the middle of the floor. So if there's any questions to be asked, feel free to just come up to the microphone and ask them. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question about slide uh, for end-to-end -end testing. You mentioned about Cassin similarity between answer and ground truth. And my question is Cassin similarity uh, for embeddings for these things or for what? Yes, yes, semantic similarity in here, like cosine similarity in here really means between the embedding of the question, sorry, the embedding of the answer and the embedding of your ground truth. So normally in this case, when you do end-to-end -end evaluation, you have a data set of already like your question and your answer that you expect. So what do you do in here is that you embed the answer and you embed the, like the ground truth answer and then you do cosine similarity between them. So this is what is meant by semantic similarity, semantic answer similarity, because you just do cosine similarity between these two. Okay, got it. And uh, is there any uh, advices which model to use to generate these embeddings? Like that really depends a lot of what you're doing because there are some like normal embedding models that are like, for example, uh, Gina AI embedding models. Those are pretty powerful. They have a big context length, for example. You can find them on Hacking Face. But honestly, there are so many options. There are open AI embeddings as well. Uh, the, the advantage of like using a one that you can find on Hacking Face often is that you can fine tune it if you need it. But open AI, on the other hand, is easier to like use if you're like in a hurry, let's say, because you, it's just hosted, so it's there. It depends on the level of control you need, how specific is your application. There are really many, many ways to select the embedding model, yeah. Okay, got it, thanks. Okay. Um, once again, thanks for the talk. I thought your slide about the different approaches yes. to solving, um, this one was brilliant. Um, when working with like business stakeholders, you often find people are very worried about hallucinations. So how do you, what kind of accuracy jump can you expect from using these techniques? And how do you talk to the business people about reassuring them that the hallucinations aren't going to um, stymie the whole project? Yeah, I mean, this is a bit like the holy grail, I would say, like having no hallucination, or at least, let's say, being able to guarantee that there will be very little it's, it's, really like, uh, it's really like a bit of a holy grail. So what you can say with RAG is that uh, if you want, you can go like uh, full scale with everything. You can go with like the best embedding model, the best search, the best models. And like as you can keep like, um, let's say, cutting edge 
And that way you can, let's say, guarantee that you have the lowest hallucination possible with the state of the heart. That's kind of the best you can do right now. Normally, uh, especially with the very latest model like GPT-40, at least in my experience, the hallucination, especially when paired with drug, they tend to be really, really low. But it depends a lot on what you're doing because also GPT-40 is not going to be an expert doctor. So you can try your best, but uh, also giving numbers makes little sense until you have like a full, a full system. And as, you, as we've seen, like retrievers can vary a lot. Their performance can be like really, really var variable, especially like it also depends on the data you have. Are you searching on the internet? Are you searching on your, on your like data sets? So like seeing numbers in here uh, on a, such a wide uh, possibilities, like so many possible implementations is really hard. I can say that in my experience, drug really reduces them drastically, and it's also easy to tell for them. So when you make them, for example, you make a proof of concept and you let them try with and without, especially, it's normally very easy to tell the difference. But again, you cannot guarantee like zero hallucinations or zero dangerous hallucination, or like tell them, yeah, we're not gonna have any, it's all good. It's a uh, state of the art is improving, but we're not there at zero hallucination yet. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Andrea here. Uh, I have a question about uh, the um, pre-retrieval step of uh, chunkization. As you said, it can uh, uh, affect uh, retrieval. Yeah. Um, so in your opinion, uh, what would be some of the best practice uh, for, uh, for chunking the, the context uh, in order to improve uh, retrievals? Yeah, wow, okay. This is an interesting question because, again, it depends on your retrieval. Like, I will give you my experience with uh, mid-size or like relatively large-ish embedding models. The most important part, of course, like I would say, is to really stay within the context length of the embedding model. Like some people seem to not realize that embedding models really also have a context length, and it's normally much smaller than LLMs. Not always, for example, Gina's embeddings are very large, very large context, uh, context window, but normal embeddings models actually have a very tiny one. It might be like as low as 500 tokens. So you first of all want to chunk them lower than that. And uh, next, honestly, I found out that kind of the 500 tokens might be pretty good, like 1,000 tokens maybe, depending on, again, depending on your embedding models a lot. Uh, but yeah, going very big or going close to the, like, for example, the 8K that the GINA models can embed, it makes it harder for a retriever to retrieve, just because there is so much information in the, in the chunk you're embedding that all the meaning averages out. So uh, it's harder for the, for the embedding model to tell whether the information is really there because there is so much other information that got averaged out with it. So maybe small paragraphs, 1,000 tokens, something like this, 500 tokens, depending on your model. But yeah, I would say that's kind of more or less the size I, I have in mind when I talk about this. I'm very sorry to have to what? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, ah, yeah. I'm very sorry to have to interrupt, but we have to stop now because it's already too late. So thanks you all to, for the nice questions.